No. Yes, it's recording now. All right. Uh, well, I'm going to throw a, a little program up on the screen here that I hope you'll be able to see. Um, I heard something that concerned me a little bit. You, we have one of our participants on phone, but I don't know whether she had video or not. Uh, I do. Okay, great. So you can see the screen that I've put up? Uh, yes, I can. Thank you. All right, great. Well, as Phil said, uh, he asked me to talk a, a little bit tonight about a new disease that we have on the horizon and something that, frankly, those of us in the wildlife profession are really scared about. Um, this is a disease for which the potential exists of, of literally wiping out our, our native rabbit population. Uh, but more importantly, for a lot of folks, it does not discriminate uh, between wild rabbits and domestic rabbits. Um, so it's a pretty serious um, disease that we're trying to learn more about. Now, good thing is, as best as we can tell, it is not in our area yet. So this is mostly to get some awareness and, and some heightened preparation underway in the event that it gets here. So my intent tonight is to just give you what a sort of a quick summary of what we know about it, um, why it's so worrisome to, to all of us, and then a little status update on what kinds of things we can do both for the, the folks who are into domestic rabbits and or participating and have interest in sort of the ecological aspects with our, our native populations. So with that, let me try to give a little bit of an introduction or an overview here to get you up to speed. I, I was surprised when I started delving into this uh, originally on just how important domestic rabbits are in this country. Uh, it surprised me that domestic rabbits fall in third place behind dogs and cats as the most um, used pet, if you will, in U.S. households. We have almost 7 million pet rabbits in the country today. Uh, and that's not counting all the other rabbits that are being raised not as pets, but as either food sources or uh, part of the commodity uh, industry in rabbits, uh, which would incur, include furs or pelts. So we got a lot of rabbits out there on the landscape. We also have a very active and widespread network of dealing in rabbits. And again, I learned some things as I was pulling this together about what people actually are doing with these animals. Now, I knew there was a lot of activity going on about shows um, competitions, um, you know, people who are, are proud of their animals that they're raising and, and state fairs and competitions in that sense, but I had no clue about these fashion shows where people are dressing up their rabbits in costume, uh, recreating famous people. Uh, apparently this is huge in Japan um, it was bizarre on what people do with these poor animals, but uh, the, I guess the bottom line is we're moving these things all over the globe. And as a result, um, the, the opportunity for picking up and transporting diseases, other pests, parasites, and all kinds of other things certainly has come to the fore um, in recent years. We also use rabbits in a lot of other ways uh, in our education. Uh, I don't know whether any of the 4-H or schools down your ways um, 
are using rabbits in part of their programming or not, but a lot of areas do. Uh, and certainly you're familiar with the role that rabbits have played for decades in, in research. Uh, a lot of that has changed in recent years um, under the, uh, the press for more humane conditions for these rabbits. Uh, and so that role actually has shrunk a little bit in recent years. Uh, I don't know if we have any rabbit hunters in our midst here tonight, but certainly it is one of our top prized upland small game species. A lot of folks spend a lot of hours in the field chasing these bunnies around. Um, so it's certainly important to the agency that is managing uh, these populations. And in general terms, um, you think about the role that rabbits play in the ecological food web. Uh, if we were to <clears throat> lose these animals or their numbers were significantly reduced, uh, you can do the math, so to speak, of calculating who else is going to be affected by the shortage of prey out there in the environment. Uh, there's a lot of critters that depend on rabbits as a food source. So there's a lot of things that are coming into sort of connection here. Uh, a little background to give you some sense of what has happened here recently. Uh, this is a very recent um, disease issue that has sprung up. It was first detected um, just back in, in about a little over a decade ago in France. And within months of that detection, you have to recognize it was probably ongoing uh, well before it was actually confirmed. Uh, but it spread all across Europe down into the Mediterranean basin uh, and really started having an impact on, on both wild and domestic animals over on that part of the globe. It wasn't too long thereafter that it first appeared in Australia and within 18 months, they had confirmations across that entire continent. Now recognize Australia has got a lot of rabbits. Um, their history with rabbits is not what we would want to talk about as a su successful management approach, but uh, this thing has really had an impact over there. A little closer to home, uh, the first confirmation in North America was up in Canada on the far west coast in British Columbia. Um, if you're familiar with the Channel Islands, uh, San, uh, San Juan Island um, had an outbreak there and uh, that was soon followed by a confirmed case in the state of Washington, which is just across the Puget Sound from there. But subsequent to that, uh, just about uh, a year ago, we had confirmations in Ohio and New York. Now, both of those uh, were isolated incidents from the movement of a domestic rabbit. And the clinics in which that confirmation took place uh, recognized it immediately, um, disposed of the animals, had uh, really serious uh, decontamination and believe that it had not spread outside of those um, two cases. However, that said, since that time, we've had a rash of confirmed cases out in the southwest part of the country, uh, New Mexico, Arizona, uh, and so on. You can see the list of affected states that I've um, found. And it has rapidly jumped from domestic into the wild population. They're finding hundreds of jackrabbits dead in the field, and they are uncertain as to whether they can contain it in those areas. A 
Now the main vector as it is believed uh, how we got it was through the domestic animal industry, if you will. Uh, people moving either whole animals through sales, uh, transactions and trading or through the movement of rabbit products that were contaminated. And most officials believe it was probably a combination of both. Now in terms of our current status and the situation that we are dealing with, this is, as you can probably tell from the short history that we've had, it is highly contagious and it is fatal in both wild and domestic rabbits. Uh, we have nothing to show to indicate that it has any impact on humans, which is thankful, but there, it, it is very serious to um, the, the group that we call lagomorphs, um, the, the broader sense of the rabbit and pika families. As of right now, um, we don't have a cure. There's no effective treatment to either prevent this um, through um, medicine or any kind of a, a, sort of a prophylactic situation. Uh, so once it's in the population, it's going to be very difficult to deal with it. The unfortunate thing also is that because it, it spreads and it manifests itself so quickly, um, there's not a lot of time for symptoms to develop. And even then when the symptoms, or when the disease kicks in, the symptoms are really, um, I use the term nondescript. It's very hard to separate this from a lot of other diseases that also would mimic these symptoms. Uh, to give you some sense of the rapidity with which this thing um, comes about, uh, you have a very healthy rabbit today and within three days, it's just dead. Uh, there's no real outward sign of injury or ailment. Uh, it just goes quickly from healthy and rambunctious to lethargic and then dead. Now, one caveat to that is that another characteristic with these hemorrhagic type diseases is we often see effects or evidence of the internal bleeding that is going on in the animal. Uh, and so sometimes we, fee, we see evidence of blood staining around the nose or other body openings um, and that's just simply the body trying to um, relieve the pressure and the buildup from bleeding internally. Now, some other symptoms, and this is where it gets confusing to separate it from other diseases, uh, the animal begins to, to run a fever. Uh, it goes off of food. And in many cases, you begin to see some labored breathing. Now, those symptoms are mimicked by a lot of different diseases, and you probably wouldn't think about this being the serious uh, hemorrhagic disease unless you see that evidence of internal bleeding. Now, I warn you, I got a little bit of a gross picture coming up here, so if you don't like the sight of blood, um, you may want to turn away for a minute or two. Um, but I did want to give you a sense of probably the most um, obvious and vivid indicator that veterinarians look for as a preliminary sort of test that they may be dealing with a hemorrhagic type disease. Uh, so in this case, this is a, an animal that was that came into a a clinic in Germany uh, a number of years ago and has become kind of a classic image of what, uh, what you can expect to see in an affected rabbit. 
what people always want to know is, well, how do we get it? Um, how is it transmitted? Um, again, things that make this a very difficult bugger to deal with is like so many other viruses, it tends to be resistant to a lot of things that we would hope would knock it out. This particular virus is very resistant to high temperature. Um, and it does persist on surfaces, so trying to remove it by temperature uh, has proven to be not very effective. Uh, and the, the issue of it being able to persist on surfaces of materials is quite problematic. Uh, in most cases, uh, particularly if there are more than, than one animal involved, it is that uh, physical contact, nose to nose, uh, interaction with bodily bumping and, and that kind of interaction, it is readily transmissible uh, from live animal to each other. It is also transferable by the carcass of an animal that is infected. Uh, if another animal, a live animal, comes in contact with a dead animal that has succumbed to this, uh, transmission can occur. It also can occur from the transmission from either the blood or other excretions from an infected animal. Uh, this is where that persistence in the environment and on surfaces gets to be worrisome. Uh, you could have a dead animal, uh, it has left behind or been scavenged, uh, and there are still remains in the field, there may be enough there to allow for transmission. In domestic settings or in meat production situations where you've got animals in very close proximity, sometimes even in same holding pens, uh, it is readily transmissible in shared food and water uh, receptacles, in bedding material, uh, and in other um, materials that these rabbits may have access or pass through. Where it gets bothersome, particularly for veterinarians, um, it readily is picked up and held on shoes and other clothing. So if they get a case that comes in and they suspect this, they have to completely change uh, to not spread it elsewhere in, in the clinic or in the lab. And the one that we have just found out about that again is, is very worrisome. Uh, there is new evidence to suggest that um, insects that feed on cadavers and, and carcasses and scavengers that may come upon uh, a freshly uh, killed animal or one that has died from this, and they consume that body. Um, they can then pass material even though they will not be affected by it. Uh, let's say they uh, are chasing another rabbit around and have contact, but they don't kill that animal, um, they may be able to spread this material to that currently unaffected animal. So the exposure area is a lot of concerns about how this moves, and I think it also helps to explain why it has moved around the globe so uh, rapidly. Now, what little I can offer in terms of, of treatment and, and prevention, it's a pretty short list. Um, this first section is primarily going to be directed at people who are raising rabbits as pets or have a pet rabbit or those who are running a commercial enterprise, uh, primarily with domestic rabbits. Right now, there is no vaccine for this disease available in the US. Now, I'll come back to that in a moment, but for the, for the time being, uh, that is not going to be a solution for this um, particular disease. 
And in terms of the wild population, there the administration of a vaccine to free roaming animals is always a challenge and very often proves not to be successful. I had mentioned earlier that aside from that, we have no other means of treating or trying to cure this disease. It's, it's a fatal disease to rabbits. So what we try to do is find ways to prevent that exposure through good sanitation, through isolating rabbits so that there is not close contact and the potential of spreading it between individuals. We certainly don't want domestic animals interacting freely with wild animals or at least in close proximity. Uh, when people are uh, looking for a new pet or want to expand what they may already have, uh, the advice from uh, the health labs is make sure you're getting it from a reliable source only. Uh, you know, breeders um, have to have certain types of um, documentation on hand. If you're going to be showing your animal at some of these competitions, you have to have had that animal checked by veterinarians and you have to have security clear, clearance to move it across state lines in many cases. Um, and so those folks are pretty well up to date on sort of the protocol that would be followed. Uh, but sort of the, the mom and pop breeders who are simply looking to sell animals, those would be ones that I would be concerned about. We can disinfect. Um, this virus is susceptible to uh, treatment through sanitation. Um, what is recommended now by the veterinary health folks is either a 10% bleach solution or a 10% sodium hydroxide solution. So one part bleach to nine parts water um, would be the ratio and you can treat all surfaces, um, food dishes, water bottles, uh, cages. If you had a rabbit that died or you're replacing it, um, any and all of that area and, and equipment needs to be sanitized before a new animal is introduced. If you start to see and suspect something that uh, things aren't going right with an animal, uh, there needs to be very quick interaction with a veterinarian, not in the sense that we're going to be likely to save an animal that contracts this virus, but it is to document its presence and to immediately try to depopulate in that area. Now that's going to be hard words for people who've got multiple rabbits. Um, they don't want to see their, all of their rabbits being put down. But in many cases, it spreads so rapidly that contamination may have already occurred when that first one showed its symptoms. And the only way to get out ahead of it in that particular sense is to depopulate the whole system. Uh, so we're going to get some flack from a lot of breeders and, and show people if they're going to be losing some very valuable animals to them. Um, in a generic sense, if you got a pet rabbit and you have interacted with somebody else who may have a pet rabbit, you don't want to touch your rabbit after having touched another one. Um, so complete hand washing, uh, a lot of folks are saying even to change your clothes uh, before you have direct interaction with your own animal as a way to prevent introducing something. Now in the wild rabbit population, this is what I had mentioned earlier, has got uh, wildlife managers in a real panic. Um, based on what we've seen across Europe, in Australia and other places where it has gotten into the wild free roaming population, there is really not much, if anything, that we have in our toolbox at this point to prevent it from rapidly spreading 
and really gutting that native population. There is some indication coming out of Europe now that a very small proportion of the native population seems to be developing some resistance to it, which is an encouraging sign. Uh, but what proportion of the population demonstrates that or will survive is still open to question. Uh, but there are examples in a number of places where animals right in the middle of a major outbreak seem to have survived. So they're trying to find out through genetic work um, what they may have picked up or what they had in their genetics um, that allowed them to survive. What we're trying to do at this point is just have a real vigilance in terms of monitoring and, and any time anybody sees multiple deaths of rabbits in an area. You know, anything over three or four animals that have died in a, in a vicinity uh, at approximately the same time would be a concern. And so all of the experts have asked that if you happen to witness that, to immediately get a hold of our wildlife um, professionals. Uh, so here in Virginia, that would be our Department of Wildlife Resources. Uh, now that's a new name if you've not been familiar with the change that took place as of July 1st, what used to be our Department of Game and Inland Fisheries is no longer. Uh, it is the Department of Wildlife Resources. Uh, so, you know, down your way, um, that would be getting in touch with somebody in the Marion office that serves Southwest Virginia. Alternatively, you can get in touch with uh, a representative of our state, or, uh, the state office of our federal uh, USDA uh, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. Or a last option would be to get in touch with the Office of the State Veterinarian uh, within the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Um, any of those folks are well aware of the threat and are gearing up um, to be watching for this to show up. In the interim, the advice is if you happen to see something like that in the field, don't touch, don't handle, don't try to get a sample of it. Just leave it, but get good um, directions or coordinates on where it is and provide those to the experts. The other thing which was important in the British Columbia and the Washington State situation was that um, there was a pretty rampant situation of people who got tired of their pet rabbits and simply turned them out. Um, they said the, the current epidemic, if you will, of, of rabbits on the San Juan Island system was as a result of a domestic rabbit uh, rearing facility going out of business and they turn 3,000 domestic rabbits loose on the island. Uh, so that kind of a situation, if you've got a domestic rabbit you don't want anymore, there are ways to deal with that other than turning it out. Um, Survival is usually not good to begin with, um, but that's that some do survive. Uh, similarly, if you happen to notice a bunch of what you would think were domestic rabbits running around, uh, it's very likely that they are ones that people let go. Uh, and so the officials definitely want to know about those so they can be um, handled. Now, some specific guidelines, if you know somebody, either yourself or friends or family that hunt rabbits, uh, there are some precautions that have been um, developed and are being disseminated as we speak. 
Uh, if you see animals that just don't seem to be reacting as you would normally expect in the wild, there's probably something going on. It doesn't have to be this disease, but given our concern about it, uh, we want to be sure that we can get it checked out. But any animal that appears to be very lethargic or what you would interpret as being sick, that's not one you want to harvest and handle. That would be one that you'd want to report. If you are successful and you bring some rabbits home, uh, before you process, you want to handle that animal with protection. Rubber gloves uh, or some type of latex or nitrile. Uh, those latter ones are getting very rare now with this corona uh, epidemic. Uh, wearing an apron or some kind of disposable protection so you don't get anything on your clothes. Uh, this is mostly just to protect you from potential exposure that you could then spread. When you've finished processing your animal, um, all of the parts, the carcass, anything that's left from that, uh, the recommendation is to bag it up and burn it. Uh, if that's not allowable or you're not in a situation where that can be done, then they say to double bag and bury deep something that would be well below the depth at which the typical scavenger would be able to sense is present and dig it up. Um, Originally, when I first saw some things come out on this, they talked about double bagging and putting it in the trash. And a lot of epidemiologists had a hissy fit when that happened. Um, we don't want this stuff being spread around or potentially uh, exposing the, the folks who handle our refuse uh, who may raise rabbits or something being exposed. So do not do that or don't encourage people to just bag it and throw it in the trash. Once you've finished processing, obviously you need to clean up. Uh, it's not to say that there is any exposure yet in our area, uh, but it's just a good habit to get in, in, into your normal operations here. Washing, sanitizing the cutting boards, the, the uh, surfaces on which that processing took place, any and all tools and implements you used, um, thorough cleaning and sanitizing or disinfecting is strongly recommended. As I had mentioned earlier, if you've got a pet rabbit, um, you don't want to have any contact with it until you have changed your clothes after handling the wild rabbits. Wash your hands, completely get yourself clean before having any interaction. And I've taken some flack from some other groups that when I post this last piece here, they, they say, ah, you're ruining the meat. You're cooking it to death. Um, speaking from my own personal, I don't have any meat that doesn't reach 170 degrees. I, don't, I just, I'm a, not a germaphobe, but uh, I've gotten sensitive to the tenacity of some parasites and other things. So... They say at a minimum, cook it until it's reached an internal temperature of 165 or higher, um, just to be on the safe side. So just to sort of wrap up with some final thoughts here, uh, what we've been talking about. There's very little doubt in the minds of, of experts and managers that it's probably just a matter of time. Given the level of movement, particularly among the domestic and um, the, sort of the commercial industries related to rabbits, this is going to be showing up in different places. Uh, we have little doubt about that. And given the indiscriminate um, outcome among any type of lagomorph, um, it's going to have far-reaching impacts. 
the sort of the domestic folks are not immune from this. So this is not a wild rabbit only situation. It's any rabbit. Um, and so folks with pets, um, particularly kids, need to be getting the word on proper handling of their, their animals. Now, I had mentioned earlier that here in the U.S., there is no vaccine available. Now, there is in Europe, or there is at least a, a derivative from an earlier virus um, that goes back to the late 1800s or early 1900s. You know, if you've been following our, our COVID-19 situation, these coronaviruses have been around for a long time. Um, they're sort of in the general family of our influenzas, and we've got vaccines for a lot of those. Uh, but this particular one, um, it has mutated to the point where those don't work on, on uh, this particular type of corona that we're dealing with. Um, right now. Very similar situation with this hemorrhagic disease. Um, there is a, a long-standing um, uh, vaccine that has been used in Europe for the earlier iterations of this hemorrhagic disease. The RHDV1 um, been used for quite a while and been very effective, particularly in the domestic uh, side of things but it has proven not to be very reliable or effective on this new variant. But there's a lot of work going on. There are three companies right now, all with European bases of operation, that claim they have a, a vaccine um, that is ready for use. The kicker here though is USDA doesn't believe it. They haven't seen the results of that testing, uh, and they're not willing yet to certify its use here in the in this country. Uh, they're getting some very severe um, kickback from uh, state veterinarians through their uh, professional organization and from the American Rabbit Breeders Association. Uh, they've heard from their colleagues in Europe that they have vaccinated rabbits and they've survived. So I think we're going to see a push-pull battle going on here for a while. Uh, USDA is pretty stringent in what gets accepted and registered for use. Uh, but right now we have to tell people that there is no vaccine currently available. And so we're kind of left with this last issue of just keeping our eyes open, um, looking for symptoms, uh, and if we find anything that is suspect to immediately notify the folks who can go and verify and perform the confirming tests to either say yay or nay. But then it begs the question of, all right, if we find it, then what? Um, I think it's just a matter of if we can get people prepared now and aware of it, just get the word out there. Um, maybe by the time it gets here to the East, um, this vaccine situation may have resolved itself. Um, that's really only going to apply for domestic situations. Well, there's just so many issues of how would you ever deliver a vaccine to wild free roaming animals. That one we haven't even begun to figure out. So I think it's still gonna be a devastating situation at that point. So with that, I will stop talking here um, and certainly would entertain any questions as best I can try to answer them or, or just chat about maybe your concerns or things that seem to be important from your perspective. So, Phil, do you want to moderate? I'm sure if anybody has any questions, you can either type it into the chat box or just unmute yourself.
How would you tell a feral rabbit from a wild rabbit? In some cases, you may not be able to um, because there are some versions of domestic rabbits that are brown and, and look somewhat similar to our wild rabbit. In most cases, though, the preferred uh, domestic strains, if you will, often are colored very differently from our native ones. So you're going to have whites, uh, black and whites, um, tans, uh, sort of mottled white and brown. I mean, there, there's just so many different uh, colors. Um, you see lop ears, uh, very short ears. They're going to look very different uh, physically from our, our native one, but there are a couple of varieties that are fairly similar. I guess the, the one characteristic is that even among those closely resembling domestics, none that I'm aware of have a white tail. Uh, and so that may be a way to try to separate those from our native ones. Most of our native ones are going to have that white cottontail. Okay. Thank you. So if our dog brings in a rabbit and we don't know, it's best just to go ahead and dispose of it burn it or bury it and yeah I would um, you know if you if you don't know where it has come from um, that would be a concern uh, I know some folks uh, my old timers would say oh thanks dog let's cut it up and put it in the stew um, I'm not so sure I would try that, that today um, I would bury it or if you have the facilities, burn it up just to be safe. Um, I might try to wipe down Fido a little bit if possible, because you don't know what it may have gotten into or where it got it from. Um, obviously you don't want to disinfect it internally, but at least clean it up. And if it's got blood anywhere on its muzzle or someplace, I would, do your best to try to clean that up. Right. It would be interesting if you could backtrack or uh, if, if Fido could show you where he got it from to see whether there's any other carcasses laying around. That would be my concern. You know, where did he get it? <laughs> Hey, any any other questions for Dr. Parkhurst? Well, if you let me just uh, offer here, there are some some places where if you're really interested in this, or if you're interacting with people, I don't know how much your group interacts with teachers or uh, school programs or that kind of stuff, but. Um, I do have some links to some very reliable resources for additional information on different aspects. Uh, and I could make a list of those available to you uh, that you could then uh, check out yourself and the ones that you think are appropriate for your audiences, uh, you could make aware for them. So okay, great. If that's of interest, I can get that list to fill. Yes, please. Okay. 